Praise God. Sure is good to see everybody. You know, there's two threads tonight that are intimately connected. I can totally identify with what Bob said about the, the fact that, you know, we have, we're challenged to surrender all, and how do you do that? That's the condition we're in. That's the problem every one of us faces. And yet the, uh, the, the, what Bobby mentioned, Brother Bobby is exactly right. There is a, there's a level of trust. And, uh, you know, I, I've shared some things in Florida recently. I haven't been able to get some of them out of my mind. And, you know, what I've been thinking about is very much related to everything that's been said tonight and that. And I believe it goes back to the very basis by which God deals with man. Because here we were in a hopeless situation, unable to trust him, unable to do anything. And into that, uh, he came to a man uh, several thousand years ago named Abram. And the man was just minding his own business and living a life, uh, you know, as an idol, among idol worshipers. Certainly, I'm sure he had his own idols. And uh, God all of a sudden spoke to him. And somehow, I'm sure it was divine enablement. I mean, how else could a man respond to God if God doesn't actually work in their heart and help them? But somehow this man did not resist. Because that's our problem. It's when God does speak, what do we do with it, you see? That's where, that's where the walk while you have the light comes in. God does give light. He has given light by sending his son into the world. The question is, what do we do with it? But Abraham simply believed God. He had the childlike faith Brother Bobby was talking about, but it was a childlike faith that, that impelled him to do something, didn't it? And, you know, I was just thinking about what faith really is. You know, we, we all have our concept of faith. A lot of people just think it's a kind of a mental thing. But real faith has two parts. One of them is trust. Because it's a, it's a personal trust in the one in whom we place our faith. It's beyond just, yeah, I believe what you said, Lord. It's I believe you. Amen. It's the same kind of, of faith and trust, rather, that a child has because it's the parent. Not because they understand, but because of who it is that is saying whatever is being said. And so there was this fundamental trust, but what is trust without obedience? You see, he actually put legs to his faith because God, you know, fundamentally God deals with us very simply with a promise. God came in and he made a promise. And the reason he made a promise is because what he intended to accomplish is, was something that only God could do. Only God could, could accomplish the thing because he, he called Abraham to, to go to a country and to, to leave his family. And he says, I will make you a great nation. You will be a blessing. I'll bless those that bless you. I'll curse those that curse you. And in your name, all and in your descendant, all nations of the world will be blessed. Well, I feel about as, you know, I'm sure Abraham felt about as helpless to see, to expect, to be able to expect by any reasonable, uh, you know, reasoning, to be able to expect such a thing to happen as we feel that same sense of, oh God, uh, the things that you've set before us, how can they be? But the thing I believe, I sense God saying to me is that it is by a promise of something that God can do. And what God is looking for from you, what God is looking for from me is a simple promise trust that is willing to say, God, I recognize that there is something here I cannot do, but I believe you. Amen. And I believe you enough to obey you. You know, that trust and obey, that sounds like a pretty good thing for someone to write a hymn about. <laughs> Maybe somebody ought to try that sometime. Somebody had some insight, didn't they? I mean, doesn't that break it right down to the simplicity of what God is looking for? How many of you can save yourselves? How many of you can, can make yourself over into what God desires? How many of you can fulfill the purpose of God in creating you? No, we can't do that. But that isn't the gospel. And that wasn't what God did through Abraham. You know, I was, I was so blessed last night uh, with the emphasis upon uh, the call of Abraham to take his son, his only son whom he loved, and sacrifice him. Uh, it's interesting that Sue and I were having a conversation on the way down here. I said, that's exactly the thing we were talking about, was the inherent idolatry. 
here was this man who was brought along to a certain point and God saw that you know, the potential for his heart to be focused all of a sudden on the blessing and on the son and that become a substitute for that, that relationship with God. And so he put his fingers, has God ever done that to you? Put his finger on something and say, you're going to have to let that go. But that is the very essence of what God is doing and what he is going to be doing from now until we, till Jesus comes, until we turn our toes up. It's going to be a simple trust and obedience. And I'll tell you, we have a God who has made promises to us that are beyond imagining. I mean, I can't imagine some of the things that he says in this book. How can that possibly be? Uh, well, you remember how, uh, what Mary said to the angel. Doesn't that sound like how the Lord operates, he came to Mary and said, you're, you know, I can't rec recall this right now. I didn't, hadn't thought about this before, but, but he said, you're going to be, you're going to have a child. And his name will be Emmanuel and he save his people from their sins. And how can this be seeing I don't know a man? See, but yet she trusted. She believed the promise of something that had never happened before and has never happened since. And the God of, of the promise fulfilled what he said. Now, what did she do to qualify for that? She believed. She trusted. How do we get our sins forgiven? How do we get anything to happen that's of a spiritual nature? God gives a promise, and we believe it from our hearts, and we obey him. Doesn't that break it down? Just, you know, I, I keep thinking of, of instances of this, of this word promise in the scriptures. Look at Acts chapter 2. Now, here's the very beginning of the church. Here is, uh, here's Peter on the day of Pentecost standing up. You know, I made the comment recently uh, in light of Peter's uh, abject failure a few weeks before when a little maid said, you're one of them. And he says, oh, no, I'm not. Wondering if that little maid was there in the crowd that day, what she was to thought. Here's this guy standing up there with great boldness and said, you crucified the Lord of glory. Whoa, <laughs> a few weeks ago, you didn't know him. Something had happened. You know, come to think of it, there's that word promise involved in this, isn't there? What did he say? Tarry ye in Jerusalem until the Father will send the what? The promise of the Holy Spirit. You're not equipped to go out and do what I've called you to do right now. You're going to have to wait. I'm going to equip you. So wait, there's a promise coming. Okay, what did they do? They waited. They didn't have a committee and say, well, we've got a job to do, folks. Let's figure it out. No. They said, okay, I'll wait. Boy, it breaks it down real simple, doesn't it? My God, religion is complicated. When are we going to just learn to just simply look to God and trust him? Not, I mean, as a congregation, as a, as a group, but as individuals. This is the essence of what, of what it is to serve God in the world. Man, I need everything from him. He is the source of it all. But has not he made promises that deal with every issue that could possibly arise? Praise God. It's a supernatural deal from beginning to end. But you know, Peter preaches the, uh, the gospel, comes down to the, to the end here. Again, I hadn't looked up these scriptures. But anyway, he comes down to 38. And at the point where they're cut to the heart and they're saying, Lord, what do we do here? We get it. We, we know we got a need. We're on the wrong side of this battle here. We have set ourselves against the one that God has made Lord in Christ. And here we are, his enemies. What do we do? He says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise. See, you get the same word? The promise. That's what the gospel is. It is a promise. It's a promise that commands, that, that demands of us a trust in his ability to do what he said he's going to do, and it demands obedience. You know, I was thinking about this. Uh, my mind was just about blown the other day reading a website. I guess it shouldn't, nothing should surprise me in this hour. A lot of you know, uh, are familiar with Paul Washer. You've heard some of his messages. You know one thing about him, and he doesn't compromise the gospel. He'll look you in the eye and tell you, you've got to surrender to Jesus Christ as Lord, or you're not going to be saved. There's no compromise in him. You know, somebody's got a website out there that's all devoted to, to exposing him as a false prophet because he believes in Lord, uh, lordship salvation. Good Lord. Can you believe that? That would be like Abraham 
receiving the promise that he's going to be, uh, through his descendants, the, uh, the, everybody in the world is going to be blessed, saying, Lord, I, 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 accept your, I accept your promise, but I'm going to stay here. I'd, I'd rather, you know, I like it here, and I, I'm going to, I reserve the right to kind of go, come and go where I want to go, but I accept the blessing. That's what, that's what this accept Jesus business is all about. There ain't no such thing. You embrace him as Lord. Amen. There ain't no salvation. That would be like uh, on the day of Pentecost, somebody saying, well, I, yeah, I want this blessing. Oh, I want this promise, but I reserve the right to do as I please. I got this one pet sin I don't really want to give up. Oh, my. Uh-uh. We give ourselves to him. There is a spiritual operation. There is something that only he can do in our lives. And the only way we can, he can do it is for us to give ourselves into his hands. And he alone is able to engineer it. My God, what is the need in your life? You think about, I mean, you think about what the message today uh, that he says right there, the promise, the promise, the promise. This is the word. This is the essence of the gospel. God is making you a promise. What have you done with it? Have you ever heard it? Have you ever really embraced it? And, now, who is this for? Who is this promise for, does it say? Okay. What, is it, what does it say after that? For all the Lord shall do what? Call. Call. So that's what he did with Abraham. God personally confronted Abraham and made a promise, revealed a promise to him. I'll tell you, it has got to come down to that. I, have, has God ever really called you? Now, I'm not talking about you had some spooky experience or some, you know, some supernatural something and tingles went up and down your spine, but I mean, has God ever really confronted you in your heart of hearts and you knew you were a sinner? You, you suddenly understood why you needed a Savior? I'll tell you, that's where it begins. That's where it began on the day of Pentecost. These people were cut to the heart. They knew suddenly in the heart of hearts, my God, I'm in trouble. And they reached out. But I'll tell you, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of people trying to come to God and don't know what repentance means. They don't, don't, they don't think they really have much to repent of. Oh, I made a few mistakes, got a few bad habits, but they don't understand they're sinners. I'll tell you, there's a call of God that is going out. Amen. And you know something? God knows them that are his. It's not our job to see how big a church we can build. It's not our job to build a church to begin with. That's Jesus' job. He didn't ask me to build, a, build him a church. He said he's going to build a church. But he uses people. And he uses us. And he's looking for people who will just, you know, get outside the camp and just serve him. You just say, Lord, you have promised things that are beyond, like I say, are beyond our imagining. Oh, God, give us, the, give us that simple childlike trust to say, Father, I believe your promise. It looks ridiculous. You look at the religious mess that we have today, and you think of some of the promises in the Scripture. And everybody's eyes just glaze over. We all know that's impossible, right? I imagine it's just about as impossible as what the Lord promised the children of Israel when they left Egypt. You think about it. Just getting out of Egypt, let alone what, that, what happened afterwards. Totally impossible. But somehow they, there was enough confidence in God. There was enough uh, purpose of God that was carried out there that there, was, there were miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. The problem is not with what God can do. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for this God that we serve. Nothing is impossible for this God that we serve, folks. We need, to, we need to, God, kindle that faith in our hearts that we will just continue to do what we need to do. What did Abraham do in his life? He believed him. When God told him to do something, he did it. That's real complicated. Kind of sounds like, you know, what Brother Thomas used to say is what, what we ought to be doing. Anybody can remember what he, what he said we ought to do? Seek God and do what he says. Not build a denomination, build a school, build a, you know, get, your, get it all down. No, seek God and do what he says. I'll tell you, the path of the just is, is a shining light. It is going to shine more and more into the perfect day. We have somebody who knows the way through 
the wilderness. I don't know it, do you? But I know somebody who does. And I'm not going to get that adult mind of mine in the way, God helping me. I want to just continue to say, Lord, I believe your promise. I want to be one of those that has, that has heard your call and believes the promise that you have laid before me. The children of Israel had a real problem with that, didn't they? They got out there in the wilderness and God put them to the test time and time again. He showed himself with great power time and time again. And what happened? A whole generation got to the border of the land and they wept all night because they were giants. They had seen the mightiest nation in the world come to its knees and beg them to leave. Then they'd seen the Red Sea opened up. They saw a mountain on fire, all these things that they had experienced, and they got to the border of the land, and a few giants scared them off. But are we so different? There's a bunch of giants that stare at us, our individual lives. There's things you see in your heart and your own life as an individual. And you can look at everybody else and say, yeah, God can do the impossible, but not me, not for me. Everything but this thing that really, is, that's the giant I got to deal with. That's the one that I'm struggling with. I can't let that go. I can't, I can't do this. I can't, oh, I'll tell you, I, I need God. Amen. I need to get, lift my eyes to his ability and off of my inability because all I've got is inability. God is not asking me to, out of my resources, to do anything. He is the supplier of everything to do with eternal salvation. It's what, like Bob said, it's what Jesus brings to the table, brings to us. He brings himself. What greater gift could there be? And to open up our hearts to say, Jesus, you can have my heart and my life. I am nothing. I can never be anything. I need you. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Well, Lord, direct this. If this is you, you just uh, tell me where to go from here. But this, this concept of the promise just, I don't know, it just kind of has gripped me lately that this is, the, this is such a simple thing that how, how easily do we stumble over it? But the... Uh, you see it all through the book of Hebrews, don't you? You see the warnings about how God laid a, gave a promise and, they, and what happened? They did not enter in. Why? Because of unbelief. And all the way through, this is the promise. Well, now think about what the book of Hebrews is about. The book of Hebrews is about, is somebody writing to, and we don't know who actually wrote it for sure, but, but whoever wrote it, wrote it to, to Jews. He wrote it to Jews who were, so familiar with their past religion that they were having a hard time understanding that God was doing away with the old covenant, replacing it with an eternal one. So it was always you got the old covenant was, was meant to point to this. Now we got the real thing. Man, you better pay attention to this one. God meant business back then. He really, really means business now. Don't you fall short of it. And that's what it was all about. But, oh, I just, I tell you, I take great comfort in, in so much that's, that's in here because this is, the, this is the essence. Listen to what he says in chapter 6. Talking about a God who can do anything. Talking about a God who's faithful. Verse 13 of chapter 6, this, this he goes back to, well, let's back to, backtrack here. Verse 11, we want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end, in order to make your hope sure, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who, through faith and patience, inherit what has been promised. Is this what God is calling us to? Yes, we've got a dark world we are heading into. We're heading into some, some stormy waters in this world. But we have somebody who has given us promises. That's what I want to keep my eyes upon. Regardless of what happens in the world, God has given us a promise. Praise God. But listen to what he says then. When God made his promise to Abraham. Now he's going to go back into history, not just to give a nice history lesson, but to show the kind of a God who has, as he fulfilled his promise there, is going to be with us and fulfill ours as well, is to us. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, 
saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently and sometimes a little impatiently, Abraham, basically the bottom line was he waited, didn't he? Yeah. Bottom line was he believed. And that encourages me because Abraham's faith, it, it, there were times it showed he was human, just like we are. But you know what God looked at? God looked at the fact that even in spite of those baubles, he still believed. He still hung on to that promise. So after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Now he goes to a human example. Men swear by someone greater than themselves and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. You go into a courtroom. How do you do it? I, 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 can't, I haven't been there so long. Not, and never as a defendant, incidentally. <laughs> Not yet. Put your hand on the Bible, raise your hand. You swear by God to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help you God. Well, that's supposed to lend weight to, what your, to your testimony. You sign a document, you seal it. You're bringing in the authority of law to back up your word. It's not just, hey, hey, Joe, I'll do this. This is, okay, Joe, we are making this a legal document here. I mean this. But here's God making an eternal promise to his people. Who's he going to swear by? Who's greater than I am that I can swear by? Well, he swore by the highest of the one, one there was, himself. Praise God. He wanted to make sure that we understood. And he says that because God wanting to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul firm and secure. I'll tell you, first of all, God's word's good enough. If he's a God who can't lie, that, ought, that, I mean, that alone should be good enough. But God, didn't say, God said, well, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to make that stronger than that. I'm going to back that up with my whole character. I'm going to swear by myself, not just what I said, but I'm going to back that word up and say, I swear by myself, thus and so. Folks, we have no earthly, no heavenly reason, no kind of reason to doubt the promises that God has given to us. In every generation, that has been the issue. Do we believe what God said enough to trust him with childlike faith, enough to obey him and do what he said? and understand that the rest is up to him. That is what God has called us to in this hour. And we will inherit the promise if we stand fast. Everything God has said. You know, that, that same theme comes up so many times. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10. He's counseling the people who have been through some tr uh, troubled times and and, and they've, they've experienced some opposition, some, uh, anyway, back down here in verse 23, let us hold unswervingly, you don't go this way, don't go that way, let's hold unswervingly to the hope we have professed. Why? For he who promised is faithful. Now, he doesn't say let's hold unswervingly to what we profess because if we muster our strength, if we are full of courage and confidence, we can do it, folks. No. What's my hope? What's, what's the basis of my hope? He's faithful. Lord knows I'm, if I depend on me, it ain't going to happen. He is faithful who promised. And so then he, he talks about their, uh, all the things that they have experienced, the persecution and whatnot in verse 35. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. In just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. This is talking about the shrinking back in, in, of an unbeliever. This is somebody who has that evil heart of unbelief. They've always got that reserve down there. I got a plan B if this doesn't work out. Folks, I have no plan B. Jesus is plan A through, C, through Z, and if there's any other letters, them too. He's it. 
We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Now, obviously, this applies on every level. It applies to you as an individual. Have you heard the call of God, and have you really put your life in his hands? He is the potter. We are the clay. Every illustration you see in Scripture is, is a people who just put themselves in God's hands and say, God, you have called me by something that is, to something that is absolutely impossible to any human being. But I believe your promise. I trust you. And so I surrender my life for you to do with as you please. It's not mine anymore. I'll tell you, if God brings you to that point, you just give yourself to him. If he's, put, if he's convicted you in your heart, you take that as a call that you have the right to answer. Don't you let any devil in hell stop you from taking hold of the hope that God sets before you. He doesn't do that to, to mock you. If God convicts your heart, that's because he loves you and he wants you to answer the call. And you can answer it because it isn't dependent upon you. It's dependent upon his ability to save you, not my ability to live it. He'll work on the other. He'll do what it takes. You know, I'll just throw a couple things out at you that, that would uh, tend to make us say, oh, yeah, right, like that's going to happen. What about God's promises to us? Think about some of the things that he said. He's going to have a church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Now, that's a little hard to wrap your mind around when you look at the mess today. But I'll tell you, the same God who has acted in history is capable of pulling that off. And it's not my job to figure it out. It's not our job to get a committee together and see how we can, you know, what we can do to help Jesus out. It's our job to look to him and say, God, this is what you promised. Whether it happens in my lifetime or 10 lifetimes down the, down the road or whatever the time frame or tomorrow, whatever the time frame is, Lord, I see the promise. Isn't that what he said throughout Hebrews chapter 11? One by one, they, they believed God. He, he walked with them. But yet every one of them, it says, they died in faith, not having received the promise. In one sense, the promise, see, the promise went beyond the lifetime of these individuals. If very much time goes on, there's a lot of us here that you're going to have one of those ceremonies where you, mark, you, wall, you wheel us out in a box. Of course, we won't be there. Thank God. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that's up to the Lord. Whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. Amen. What a glorious hope. You know, you can't really lose with that one. Amen. Thank God. But we're not, some of us are not going to be here. And there's a generation that's going to go on that's going to have to walk in that same faith and have that same vision. I'll tell you, there's a spirit in religion that would suck us in if it, if it could. Say, look at you. Look at everybody else. They're so full of success and this and that and the other. I want to have the vision. I want to have his heart. I want to, I want to be faithful to his promise. And that's one that, that only he can engineer. And I'll tell you, God can make, bring about the circumstances where that will happen. He's going to purge. He's going to purify his church. That's up to him how he does it. How about in Revelation? The marriage supper of the Lamb has come. And his bride has what? Made herself ready. Is that part of God's promise? And you look at other scriptures like that. There's a promise of something that has never been. What about Hebrews chapter, not Hebrews, uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Till we all come in the unity of the faith to the, I better read it. Talks about a process that happens. Till, all, till we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the, of the fullness of Christ. Does that sound pretty impossible? Yeah, it does to me. I, all I have to do is look in the mirror and I say, God, that ain't going to happen. But that isn't where the Lord wants us looking, is it? He wants us to fix our eyes on the promise of a God who cannot lie, who cannot fail. Amen. I'll tell you, that's, that's where it's got to be, folks. And, whether, and every generation is going to have to get, wrap their minds around and their hearts around this and say, God has promised. 
And you know, there's one of the scripture that, that comes to me. I, you can go on and on with this. I don't want to belabor. But uh, first, first Thessalonians is it? I think it is first Thessalonians, Thessalonians five. This is one that I love to go to, and we've certainly used it plenty of times. Verse 23. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, in the first place, he tells you going in that may God himself do this. So we shouldn't have any illusions that this is, a, this is something, some requirement he's dumping on us as though we got to engineer it. This is something God is declaring, I will do it. In fact, that's true of everything God instructs us to do. You know, I said at the beginning, faith is two things. It's trust in the one who speaks, but it's obedience in response to that. We don't earn anything by that. We express the truth. We express true faith in that way. But you know, everything God has commanded us to do, as I've said in the past, is really a promise. It is like saying, God, you told me to do this, and in myself I cannot, but you told me, therefore I can, because it's you doing it in me. And so I act in obedience to what you told me to do. But I'll tell you, in my action, I, am under, I understand, I get it, Lord, I'm depending on you. I'll tell you, we are going to become more and more instruments of him Amen. as we come to that place. Everything we do in, under any other guise is worthless anyway, isn't it? Oh, God, help us. God, help me. I, I, I need this as much as anybody out here. But listen to what he says after that. All this that, that God is going to keep us that, that blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I, I tell you, when he comes, what is he going to find? That's what tells me I, I really don't expect him tonight, truthfully. You know, I, I can't. I just cannot wrap my mind around the idea that, that some people have that Jesus is going to come right now and rapture everybody up. He's going to come for a bunch of carnal Christians, lukewarm, half-hearted, warming pews, sitting around a lot of other people don't even know the Lord. It's like saying, like coming to the end and saying, well, I, we started off with a bang. We had a church that was full of the Holy Ghost and power. Man, they moved in God. And I've been trying for 2,000 years to get, them, to get them straightened out. And all they get is worse and worse and worse. I guess I'm just going to have to declare failure here. Just pull them out. Okay, devil, you won. Not hardly. I believe that the, that the Jesus, and I think this is, this is part of the, the vision that Brother Thomas caught so many years ago. Things are not always going to be as they are. And we can't do it, but we could certainly serve and believe in the one who can. Yes. And just devote ourselves, just, oh, what is, our, what is our job? Trust him and obey what he says. If he says love one another, that means hold, in the, hold this bitterness in your heart, right? No, that means be willing to let go. Be willing to obey the things that he says. And know that he's going to work that peace and that joy and all the fruits that he wants in our lives. That's where the fruit comes from, Bobby. It's staying near that river. Jesus is that river. Amen. There's a source of life that we can have that can change us from the, in, at the heart level. That's what I need. I don't need simply change in behavior. I need him to fix what's in here because it's not right apart from him. But what does he say here? The one who calls you See how this all ties together? The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. So you get how this all goes together? All of God's reaching out towards us is, a, is based on a promise. And there's a people that he's going to call with that promise. They're going to believe him. They're going to obey him, and he's going to fulfill his word. And he's going to have a people that he is going to redeem for all eternity. I want to be part of that people. I want on an individual level, and I want us to, to have that vision as a congregation. There's stuff in here we need to walk in, folks. We don't need to say, oh, it's, it's okay. We can just sort of muddle through and live our little private lives and have Jesus kind of in there somewhere. We need him to be the center. And I'll tell you, 
the thing, well, I know one of the scriptures that I meant to, I meant to say something about. It's just uh, back in 2 Corinthians. Chapter 6. I'm going to back up to a familiar scripture in, in verse 14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? So that ties it in with some other things that have been said. What harmony is there between Christ and Belial, or the devil? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Does that sound like a promise? That's a promise. That's the word of a living God who cannot lie, who's sworn by himself. There's a promise that's been out there. So what, what is our part in this? Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. I will be a father to you. You will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Praise God, I need somebody who can engineer and do all this. Amen. But that's his promise. And listen to what he says, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. See how it all goes together? I'll tell you, we've got a God who has promised things that we haven't begun to see. But I believe he's going to have a people in the earth who are simple enough to trust him, who are willing to obey him and stand fast in a, against a host of challenges. The devil is going to throw everything he can at us individually and collectively to get us to give it up and say oh, it can't be. But I tell you, God is going to have a people that will stand fast and persevere and he will fulfill his promise because he is faithful. Praise God. Hallelujah.